Be alert this morning. My guess is if you were to sit down and read through the work of Dr. Luke when he wrote the book of Acts, you probably would not catch all that's in chapter 20. Brother Powell, sometimes it creates for us as pastors a nightmare when there's so much in such a small space. And somehow we're supposed to craft that and alliterate that so it sounds like at least we studied some this week. But I want you to be ready. Be ready this morning for some things that Paul said we needed to be ready for. And there are seven of those things. Find your worship guide, turn to the note-taking section under message where it says, stay alert. Now, I want to tell you why you need to stay alert, because you never know when God is going to do something. He doesn't consult with you or with me quite often when he gets ready to act. So we need to always be ready. I mean, all through the teaching of Jesus, there's this constant call to be what? Alert. He says there is a reason to be alert because of what's out there. You know, be sure you have someone on the tower watching. Church, be alert. And I'll tell you what, sometimes they dress up real well and walk in. And sometimes... What you need to be alert about is not out there, it's in here. In fact, that's the ones that he says become like ravenous wolves. That's that's an animal that rips you apart. And if you've been in church and acted very long, you are truly blessed if you've never seen the evil one tear up a church. Because he certainly does it. We need to be alert. How many of you have found yourself at some time in your life caught up in a terrible habit? Caught up in some kind of sin that you didn't see coming? You know, Satan is rarely obvious. He just takes you a little bit at a time. And then one day you look up and he's got you. That's why the Bible says he's like a roaring lion moving to and fro upon the face of the earth looking for whom he may rip to shreds. You never know the lion is there until you hear the sound of his voice and the paralyzing moment of reality is when he makes his death blow. Be alert. Paul said, I preached it. To you elders in Ephesus for three years, and I did it over tears. Be alert. Oh, my goodness, don't tell me that microphone was mine. Y'all hear that? My heart's beating. (laughs) All right, so much for an introduction. Do I need to take this thing off and go to something else back there, brother? Go ahead. All right, let's look at chapter 20. You need to be alert because there's always that thing that catches you unexpecting. You're not looking for it. Notice in these first... Twelve verses. We'll not read all of them. When the uproar had ended, that's the riot that just took place over the silversmiths and the money-making opportunities in Ephesus. Right after all that had taken place, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, He said goodbye, and he set out for Macedonia. Well, is 
that sometimes upsetting when someone you don't expect to leave? Right after they've told you how much they love you and they encourage you in what you're called to do and what God blessed you with to say, I'm leaving. I am not reading the letter of resignation this morning. I don't care how much y'all might think that's what this is. Have you got got something else for me? Oh, it must be me. importance of this is not that you can't hear me, it's that you hear me better on the recording if I have this on. But, I mean, you, you see, you can't appreciate. They're back there going. And I'm thinking, how can I stall? I, I, I need to tell you a good joke. I just can't think of one. Uh, but, but anyway, we're going to have to go on, working or not. So in chapter 20, he tells about this uproar because of the riot that the silversmith's guild has uh, caused to happen. And then the clerk, as we saw last week, comes in. He calms everybody down. He actually excuses the charges made against all of the believers. And that's what it's talking about when you open chapter 20 and it says, when the uproar had ended, there were some folks thought they were going to get killed. Let me ask you something. If somebody got stirred up about the things of Christ and they thought it was because of you folks sitting in here this morning and you thought as a result of coming today you were going to get killed, would you be glad that that uproar was over? Oh, come on now. If you'd have thought there's a chance of that, you wouldn't have showed up to start off with. All right, so the uproar is over. But then he says goodbye. They didn't expect that. He says goodbye, and he sets out to Macedonia. He's going to go back and do two things that are his very heartbeat. He's going to strengthen and encourage the church, and then he's going to take up offerings for churches that he has planted that are struggling. These are the two intentions of Paul as he makes this journey and what we'll find soon, this known to him by the Spirit last journey, this journey of death just like the one Jesus took to Jerusalem. And so he traveled through the area speaking many words of encouragement to the people and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months, but he couldn't stay longer, though he wanted to. Now that's Greg George's parenthetical. Because the Jews made a plot against him just as he was about to sail for Syria. So instead of doing that, he's surprised. Thus he has to go back by land and circumvent their plans to interrupt and in some way seize him. And finally, in Miletus, he'll meet up with the rest of the group. Now, it's a great place for a pastor to end reading in one part of the text and jump to the next. Do you know why? Does anyone in here know why? Look at those names. Oh, my goodness. So we'll just read in verse 5. These men went on ahead, and they waited for us at Troas. 
Get your app out on your phone and let it read those names to you instead of you getting it in my southern dialect. But he sailed from Philippi, which is fairly certain to us that this is where Luke and Timothy at least join him. The pronouns change here in both and other parts of the text to what we call the we sections because it becomes no longer us but we. But we sailed from Philippi and up to that it was us at Troy. Do you see that right there in that transition between verse 5 and verse 6? Luke is recording but now Luke is participating. So now it's gone from us considering the body to we because he's on board. But we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread and five days later joined the others at Troas where we stayed seven days. In fact, it is so unexpecting for Paul that what he has to do is he has to alter his calendar by 50 days. Instead of being able to make this short journey by boat, travel with everyone, end up where he wanted to be, he has to adjust, adjust his entire calendar. And, and the, re, the reason we know that is because at the beginning of the story, he is at Passover, and at the end of this travel narrative, he's at Pentecost, and they're 50 days apart. By the way, you do know that's why it's called Pentecost, like Pentagon. Five, 50 Count of five, 50 days between Passover and Pentecost. On the first day of the week, what's the first day of the week? You know, I hear it all over the place. Monday, Sunday, Monday. Their first day was Sunday. It was their first work day. Now, why is that important? Because these folks work all day, and then came to church at night. And, and they didn't think anything about that. And then the preacher preaches on and on and on. I love this text. It gives me worlds of permission. Brother, just reach up there and take the clock off the back wall. On and on and on. Anybody in a window? There's nobody in the window anywhere, is there? Okay. Obviously, you haven't read beyond here, right? All right. Paul spoke to the people. And because he intended to leave the next day, which means this was his last sermon to this body of believers, he kept on talking. I won't keep you that long, I promise as though I think you would stay that long. To midnight, there were many lamps in the upstairs room where they were meeting, and seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus. <laughs> you know what that word means? Fortunate. And the way the Greek describes the fact that he is a young man means he's between 8 and 14 years of age. And I want to tell you something, young people. He's worked all day long and he still loved the Lord and what God had to say enough to come to church at night even when he was tired and sleepy. I'd love to hear what happened to him later down the road, especially with all that what's going to occur. And he was seeking into a deep sleep. It didn't mean that he just got there. It meant that he struggled against the sleepiness because he wanted to hear what Paul had to say. Paul had a lot to say because this is the last word he was going to have for the church. Now that creates our unexpected situation for it says Paul talked on and on and when he was sound asleep, that is Eutychus, I know sometimes y'all think when I'm talking I'm asleep because, but that's not what it means. Eutychus fell asleep and when he was sound asleep he fell to the ground. It was three stories high. They went up, picked him up and he was dead. Then Paul decided just to be scriptural. He went out and he did the same thing that 
uh, Elijah and Elisha had done. He stretched himself out over the boy and he prayed through the Holy Spirit to his Savior Jesus the Christ and asked them to invoke the Father to bring life back into that boy. And when he prayed that prayer, he was resuscitated. You notice I didn't say resurrected. You do know there's a difference between being resuscitated and resurrected. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Resurrection means you got the new body. Resurrection means that uh, this is over and all of eternity has come. But for Eutychus, he was back to being a 8 to 14 year old that had just had a fall from a three story building, killed himself, and been brought back to life by the supernatural power of God. And so it says that alarmed, he goes, he does this, and the boy is alive. Then he went upstairs again and he broke bread and ate. Now I want you to notice two things. In verse 11, it says he broke bread and ate. And up in verse 7, it says on the first day of the week they came together to break bread. Now it doesn't in the English distinguish for us, but there are two different kinds of bread breaking. The bread breaking in chapter 20 and verse 7 is the Lord's Supper. And the bread breaking in verse 11 of chapter 20 that we just read is the agape feast. Where they have a meal. A fellowship meal. Two different meals, two different purposes. After talking until midnight, um, until daylight... Paul left, and so they, they had an all-night lock-in, young folks. Only crazy young people do that. And we need to pray for anyone who works with young people because that is not easy on adults who look over crazy young people who stay up all night. But they were so excited. Young folks, can, can you imagine having a preacher you'd be so excited about having that you'd stay up all night? and eat, and talk, and do all that kind of stuff? If you think that's hard for you, you ought to ask these adults. They just wouldn't do it. It would be extraordinary, would it not? And they stayed up all night with Paul until the next day, and after doing this, the people took the young man home alive, and they were greatly comforted. Now, with that, we have this first unexpected thing, and I want to share a few things that I bet you miss. One, did you notice that in that passage are the five major things that are done in Christian worship? The five major things that are done in Christian worship. You know what the first one is? The first one is that God's people, when they're living in obedience to their Lord, gather on the first day. Yes, God does expect you to go to church every Sunday. Forsake not, what? The assembling of yourselves together with the believers. Now there's some reasons, as some have done, which is the reason they have gotten sick and fallen asleep. You think you're out there playing and having fun, when in reality you might be killing yourself. And even we can laugh about that in a funny matter. And you may not fall physically dead, but it can kill your relationship with God when you stop fellowshipping with the people of God. And so the scripture says, on the first day of the week, they were together. So on Sunday, the body gathered. That's two things. The Lord's day, the Lord's people, and in verse 7, they took the Lord's supper. 
They always remembered Christ and what he did on the day that they gathered. And then there is another thing. All of this was so they could hear a word from the Lord. Paul did what? He preached. You don't need to have to hear me. What you need to hear is what God has to say from his word through me. If what I say doesn't make sense, just put it in the can on the way out. But for God's sake, let the Holy Spirit open your ears and hear what God's got to say to you. Because I surely am working diligently at trying to impart that. And so, the message comes as the Savior is remembered by the people of God gathered on His day. And the fifth thing that happens is God's power moves. I believe sometimes the reason we don't have church is we don't show up for church. We just don't show up. Now, our body may be present, but we don't show up. I'm telling you, you might find some unexpected things occurring if you were to change. Number two, verse 22. Jump there with me if you would. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. He's gathered the elders. He's been rerouted. Now they've met him in Miletus. Luke and Paul and all those other guys are there. And all the elders, that is all of the spiritual leadership, the pastors that have been raised up in those churches and the leaders in those churches, Paul gathers and he's telling them goodbye for the last time. Going. I am going. I'm not just leaving to take a trip. I'm going and I'm not coming back. How would that be with you today if that person you love sitting next to you or some family in this church you love sitting in this place with you were to tell you, I just want to tell you before we leave today, I love you, I appreciate you in my life, but you're not ever going to see me again because I'm going. I'm going. We need to be alert. We need to be ready for those things that are not expected in our life as God's direction takes us where those things we value are no longer going to be our possession. He says, I'm going. But not only am I going, I'm going not knowing. What's that like? Thursday. I made a trip over to the Bennett's house. I called them on my way to find out that they had already left. So I rerouted myself to Bay Medical to the oncology, radiology section of the hospital. Came in, fixed myself a cup of chai tea and did get the sugar in it good to end the door. Came the Bennett. You know, God just sometimes does that kind of thing. Just puts you there when you need to be there. And I was able to sit down and visit with Charles and have prayer with him, and they took him right on in. And, and of course, as he went into uh, uh, the hospital there, uh, they found out that his speech uh, was not clear, that he had some confusion, that he had had some falls, And they were alarmed by this. And as a result, they decided to do an MRI and then to do some other tests and put him in the emergency room. And as a result of that, they took him and admitted him to the hospital. And I came in the next day in the morning, and there sat Barbara, and we're talking, and the doctors come in and out. And I said, you know, sometimes it's just tough not knowing. And she said, you're right. It's hard not knowing. To know. When all of that kind of stuff happens, you fully expect it not to be what? Good. And yet, you don't know. What is it that was tough for Paul that made him concerned 
about his going, but is not knowing. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders. He's got them there. He has them in verse 22. Compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me to there. Only I know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that the prison and the hardships of prison are facing me. That's what Paul knew. He knew something bad was coming. He knew he wasn't going to see those who had supported him again, and yet he is compelled by God to go. Folks, be alert in your life. You never know when God's going to call you to such a place. And then in the midst of that, we need to be alert because those types of transitions sometimes come with warning. Both Paul and the elders are warned. Verse 23, we read Paul was warned. Only I know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task God, the Lord Jesus, has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. That was a change. Not only am I going, and I know that in my going there's these things that are going to happen, but now I know I'm not ever going to see you again. And if you're like me, that's going to produce some grieving when you're separated from people that you love. So the grieving in the not knowing, in the unexpected begins. And so he says, I'm not going to see you again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. As faithfully as I have been able to do and as much as God has shown me, I have shared the good news with the gospel with everybody, everywhere I've been. I no longer have that blood on my hand. I don't know if you've got that piece cleared up in your life. But Paul had it cleared up in his. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves. Keep watch over the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you pastors or overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. There is a warning for Paul, but Paul as he leaves and he says, I'm not going to see you again. I want to warn you that the same evil one that came for me, the same evil one that came for Jesus, he's coming for you. Be warned. Friend, if you think that the Christian life is a stroll down easy streets, you are mistaken. In fact, the closer you walk to the Lord Jesus, the more apt you are to be involved in spiritual warfare. And so, they are warned, both Paul and the elders. But then he says, persevere. Persevere. Notice back in verse 24 how he expects them and you and I to persevere. Notice what he says there. It's very insightful. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of the gospel of God's grace. What is the alertness that you should have and I should have when it comes to to persevering, be alert that you ought to be, as Paul, determined. There is determination. 
be alert as Paul was that to determination takes dedication. Get up and live it every day. And you set the goal in front of you. And that goal is to complete what God has purposed and gifted you to both be and do. And when you have that, my friend, you can persevere. We've already spoke of number 6 in verse 25, and then again for the elders in 28, that because of what had come, they were grieving. Folks, it's right to grieve when we lose. But I want to remind you of what Paul reminds us of. We grieve, but we grieve in hope. This isn't it. Separation isn't it. Losses aren't it. Our Lord has rose victorious over sin, death in the grave, and the evil one has been conquered, and this is but a mild, temporary stay in comparison to the glories of eternal bliss that await the children of light. But nevertheless, as Jesus grieved, as Paul and the elders grieved, when you lose, grieve. But grieve in hope. Because this isn't it. And then the last thing. Be alert so that in every situation where unexpected goings and not knowings and warnings and needings to persevere and grieving comes as the body of Christ, we can build one another up in the faith. Encouraging. Be alert so you can encourage. Scripture states clearly, encourage one another in the Lord. Exhort, which means to build one another up in the faith. Now, folks, This message isn't one that begins with an exciting introduction where microphones mess up and ends with some kind of tear-jerking response given by a passionate closing story on the part of the preacher. But I have kept one of my promises. I'm not going to go on and on and on and on. Amen. Amen. But in this new year, and in this season as we go forward for Christ, what am I encouraging you from God's Word to do? I'm encouraging you to do what Scripture says, both in season and out of season. Be ready to give a response for the faith that's in you. And here are seven ways to do it, given us by the Apostle Paul to the elders and the believers in Macedonia. I pray that you will find help in these. But there's one thing that is for certain. If you don't know Christ, and by that I mean, if you've not come to that place where you have surrendered all of the stuff, is there anybody in here that doesn't understand that collective word stuff? You know, those mistakes, those bad habits, those failings, those attempts that you probably resolved a couple of weeks about and have already failed at, or at least you're thinking about giving it up. All that stuff that's in the human predicament that shows us the truth of what Paul said when he said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All that stuff, if you've not given that up to the Lordship of Christ, and receive that transforming work of the Spirit that takes you from the likeness of the flesh into Him and the likeness of the Spirit. Let me encourage you to receive Christ in faith. And if you have, and you're discouraged, and you're despondent, remember this. Paul did all these things to the point that the guillotine or axe fell and took his head from his body.
joy is peace, free of outside circumstance. And the way you stay there is by being alert. Look at what's going on around you and be sure that in everything that you do, whether according to your plans or not, you walk in joy. That peace that God gives, knowing He's got you. Christians, you need that if you're going to be successful in your Christian life. Stand with me 